Good afternoon, and welcome to this 30-minute webinar, Therapeutic Vancomycin Monitoring Using AUC. My name is Scott Kelly, and I serve as Vice President of Sanford Guide. Uh, throughout this webinar, I do encourage you uh, to submit any questions that you might have via the Q&A feature. Um, we're going to reserve some time at the end of the webinar for any questions you might have. Uh, the webinar is also being recorded, and we hope to post it online next week. So if you have any colleagues who are unable to attend uh, today, you can direct them to our YouTube channel uh, to view this at a later time. Um, we are joined today by Sanford Guide editor Douglas Black, PharmD. Uh, Professor Black serves on the pharmacy faculty at the University of Washington in Seattle, where he has been recognized for excellence in teaching by students and his colleagues alike. His expertise is in the field of pharmacology of anti-infection infective agents, and he has published numerous articles on the subject. He joined the Sanford Guide editorial board in 2012 and is the principal author of our monthly ID update newsletter. Thank you, Professor Black, for leading this webinar today. Thank you, Scott, for that introduction. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for attending. I'm going to keep my video off so that the connection is as strong as possible. And now I'm going to share my screen. So bear with me for a second. Okay. So again, thank you so much for attending. We're going to talk today about therapeutic monitoring of vancomycin using the area under the serum concentration time curve, or AUC. With the release of the revised vanco monitoring guidelines in June of this year, things have become somewhat more confusing, and I'm hoping to clear things up a little bit with this brief overview. We have three major goals for today. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about why this change to AUC24, and AUC24 refers to area under the curve over a 24 hour period. Why the change to that monitoring has been suggested, what are the ways to determine AUC24, and then we're gonna try it out. But before we get to work, I do wanna take a few moments and just get everybody thinking and me warmed up by showing you this. I, looked, I took a look back through history to see what else has happened on December 11th. I figure that there are probably people in the audience who know everything about vancomycin that I'm going to share. And if that's the case, then maybe one or two of these things you didn't know, and that way everybody can leave having learned something. So what else happened on December 11th? Well, in 1932, San Francisco recorded its coldest low temperature ever, a 27 degrees Fahrenheit. And I can only imagine there are some people out there just shaking their head at that number. Uh, earlier this week on December 7th was the 79th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941, and four days later, uh, both Germany and Italy declared war on the, on the United States. The only TV personality I heard say anything about Pearl Harbor was Chris Berman on ESPN, and I'm hoping that there were others that acknowledged it. UNICEF was established in 1946. UNICEF stands for the United Nations Children's Fund, and it's a humanitarian aid organization. I've had to remind many students of that over the years as they have put UNICEF down as a cephalosporin of choice for some particular question. There have only been 12 men that have landed on the moon, and the last two to do it were Jack Schmidt and Eugene Cernan, and that was in 1972 on December 11th. And that was in Apollo 17. And it was actually Cernan who was the very last person to leave his footprints on the moon. In 1997, the Kyoto Protocol was adopted. There were 192 parties to the Kyoto Protocol, which was intended to limit and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It did not go into force until 2005. And by the way, the US had already dropped out four years prior to that. It ended in 2012 amidst amidst mixed reviews, replaced by the Doha Amendment that eventually gave way to the Paris Climate Agreement in 2015. And finally, Stephen Hawking in 2012 won the $3 million breakthrough prize in fundamental physics. That prize is the most lucrative academic prize in the world. 
And uh, the late Stephen Hawking, who was an English physicist, physicist and cosmologist, won the prize for his discovery of a certain type of radiation from black holes and also for his contributions to quantum theory. All right, so with that, let's return to vancomycin. You're looking at Delicate Arch in Arches National Park, Utah. And I'm showing you this slide for a visual image of perspective because we need to take a moment to provide perspective, the proper perspective. These new AUC monitoring recommendations for vancomycin that we are talking about today, which are part of the 2020 revised guidelines published earlier this year, are not meant to be used anytime vancomycin is used for anything. They are not universal, they're not intended to be. They were developed for serious MRSA infections in patients receiving more than three to five days of therapy. And that's the perspective I wanna provide. Now, what constitutes a serious MRSA infection? It would be something like sepsis, bacteremia, infective endocarditis, pneumonia, or osteomyelitis, an infection such as that. We are not talking about non-bacteremic skin and soft tissue infection or urinary tract infection. And all that said, we continue to be in need of data for other microbes, such as MSSA, coagulase negative, strepto coagulase negative staphylococci, streptococci, and others for validation of AUC monitoring for them. So looking back a little bit, the first consensus guidelines for therapeutic monitoring of vancomycin in adults appeared in the AJHP in 2009. And it's worthwhile taking a quick look back at them to see what they recommended. Now, there were a number of recommendations in these guidelines, and I'm sharing three of the ones that I think are most important to our discussion today. One was the end of routine vancomycin peak concentration monitoring. Prior to 2009, we were monitoring peaks and troughs. And for those of us who were practicing in those days, this was a welcome thing. Peak concentrations are problematic, as you know, for a variety of reasons, and not having to, to measure them and follow them and react to them was a good thing. So they went away in 2009 with these recommendations. A second point was the establishment of the ratio of the AUC24, area under the curve under over 24 hours, divided by MIC of 400 or greater as the main measure for vancomycin clinical efficacy. I'll say that again, the establish of the AUC, establishment of the AUC MIC ratio of 400 or more as the main measure of vancomycin clinical efficacy. And this was based on a modest amount of data, not an overwhelming amount of data, but it was based on a modest amount. And then finally, third point, the suggestion that a trough of 15 to 20 micrograms per mil can serve as a reasonable surrogate for that AUC to MIC ratio. As long as the MIC of, uh, for the pathogen is one microgram per mil or less, which they almost always are. So these are the three main points in 2009. And since 2009, we have been happily monitoring trough only concentrations, uh, targeting troughs of 15 to 20 in our sickest patients. But here is where we are now, and uh, as captured in the revised 2020 guideline update that I referred to earlier. Now, there's some overlap in these points that I've identified here, and, it, and this can all get very confusing if you dig into it as to what do we think versus what do we actually know. But I do think we know these five things, and I'll, I'll read through them for you. I think it's pretty clear that trough concentrations are not an optimal surrogate for area under the curve. The correlation between trough concentration and area under the curve is not what we maybe thought it was. Point number one. We've also learned that we see more kidney injury when trough concentrations are 15 micrograms per mil or higher compared to trough concentrations less than 15. Point three, we have good evidence that at least for serious MRSA infections, the target AUC24, assuming the MIC is one, should be 400 to 600. And by targeting 400 to 600, we minimize nephrotoxicity and maximize efficacy. 
I would point out that that upper limit of 600 was not mentioned in the 2009 guidelines. So in these guidelines, we added the, the, 400, the, the 400 threshold we identified earlier has now become a range. Now this latter point about assuming a Vanco MIC of one, I, I can expand on that just a little bit. There's a number of issues why that's reasonable and probably and, and the correct thing to do. Now, an important issue is that the Vanco MIC is, is method dependent. And, and so whatever method is being selected to measure it, say broth micro dilution versus e-test versus some automated method, you get a slightly higher number or slightly different number, I should say. So there's that. You know, we know that at most institutions, the MICs are still no greater than one. There hasn't been a, a tremendous amount of MIC creep, at least not everywhere. And we also know that when you measure MICs, there's a plus or minus correction, uh, plus or minus one dilution as a, as a correction factor. So when you add all that up, it is reasonable right now to simply assume the MIC is one unless you know it isn't by an established method. And the established method would be broth micro dilution, which is not commonly done in clinical practice. So we're gonna go forward here with the idea that targeting a AUC 24 of 400 to 600 is a reasonable thing to do. It's also reasonable in pediatrics, although I think our data suggests that for most non-central nervous system infections, an AUC 24 closer to 400 is probably adequate. And then this five point, this fifth bullet, which is a little bit of a, a, a little repetitive compared to uh, with the others, but I wanna emphasize it, is that for reaching the area on the curve target and thereby minimizing nephrotoxicity, AUC monitoring by one of two approaches is better than trough only monitoring and it has some additional benefits. So I feel pretty confident that the data support that, that compared to trough only monitoring, measuring the AUC in some fashion will certainly help with le less, less nephrotoxicity and will probably help in some situations with efficacy. And there's two main ways to do it. And we'll talk about those in just a second. I think this graph is a nice, nice illustration of why the trough is a poor proxy for area under the curve. So you're looking at a vancomycin serum, time, serum concentration time curve. Up, down, up, down. You can imagine this, maybe this is one gram Q8 hours. So you're looking at a 24 hour dosage interval with a couple of doses. And what you can see is if you maintain a trough of 15, here's the trough concentration of 15, you are guaranteed an area under the curve of 360 because it would be 15 micrograms per mil trough times 24 hours, that's 360. Whatever is left over in terms of the peak concentration above the trough line, so the, the blue area, that's going to add to the area under the curve. So you could have a trough of 15 and therefore an AUC of 360, which is close to 400, but you could have a whole much but higher of an area under the curve, depending on how much blue there is. And how much blue there is is going to depend on how high the peak is and, and the shape of the concentration time curve there. So the point here is a trough of 15 could result in an area on the curve considerably greater than 360, depending on how high the peak is. Conversely, one could have a trough, an AUC of 360 or 400 with a trough under 15, again, if you have a lot of blue area. So this is a graphic depiction of why, one reason why we don't really feel like troughs can be used as surrogate predictors of area on the curve. We need to measure them. Now, this is the way one does it via trapezoids. And I'll just take you through this briefly. Serum time, concentration time curve looks like that. This is a dosage interval, say, let's say some arbitrary length of time. Dose is given there, infused over a certain amount of time. When we monitor patients, we get a peak and a trough. We generally get a peak maybe an hour after the dose has been infused. So the measured peak is here, and then we would get a trough before the next dose, and it would be, say, there. 
Now you couldn't just merit, you couldn't just measure the area under the curve using those numbers because you would lose a whole bunch of area. So a the comp the calculations have to account for all this additional area here by back extrapolating to what we what we could call the true peak. So we take our measured peak and then we have back extrapolated using calculations to get to that number. And then conversely, we take the measured trough and we forward extrapolate it there. So then when we go to calculate the AUC, we can draw two trapezoids. This trapezoid here and that trapezoid there. We can independently measure the areas under both, add them together, and that becomes the area under the curve for this dosage interval. And if the person's getting the drug twice a day, you multiply that number by two, and that's your AUC 24. Notice that by doing area under the curve calculations with trapezoids, you're not going to get all the area. And that's represented by this area here. There just is no way to draw two twin trapezoids and capture all the area. So that is a known issue with area under curve calculations using trapezoids. So what about this Bayesian? Well, meet Thomas Bayesian, who lived from 702 to 1761. He was an English philosopher, and he came up with something called Bayes' theorem. Bayes' theorem, in a nutshell, holds that one's initial beliefs, which we'll call the Bayesian prior, plus new evidence equals a new and improved belief, and that's called the Bayesian posterior. In the context of vancomycin monitoring, the Bayesian approach takes population estimates of vancomycin pharmacokinetic parameters, which can be specific for patient subgroups like critically ill patients or pediatric patients. It takes those estimates and then combines it, combines those estimates with patient-specific data, the data that you feed into the, the software, to provide a revised estimate of PK parameters, which we can then use for dosing. How does the trapezoidal method and the Bayesian method compare? Well, here's a, a chart to show you these things. Pros and cons. The trapezoidal method uses simple equations familiar to most clinicians. If you were trained in pharmacy school, you learned how to do this at, at some point. Trapezoidal methods require steady state, so you, you can't get them right away. You have to wait until the patient's at steady state for the best estimates. And you need a peak and a trough. So you need two concentrations post distributional peak and trough at steady state. In contrast, the Bayesian method will, will work with a single level. Although we have some data that suggests that for some patient subtypes, two levels probably work better and that, that's gonna evolve over time. But it's still reasonable to think that in many situations, it only takes one concentration to do the Bayesian work. You don't have to be at steady state, which means you could probably get an AUC faster and that, that phrase, adapted to physiologic change, means that you can feed additional covariates into the model, such as creatinine clearance. And the Bayesian data set that you're using will also expand as more and more patients are treated. And I guess all of that sounds like it would be a good thing in terms of just having more data to work with. What's the con of Bayesian methodology is the software that has to be obtained and you have a number of choices to, to to decide which one to, to purchase, and it's not, it tends to be expensive. So what can we reasonably say about the choice between trapezoidal equations versus, the, versus Bayesian methods? Well, first of all, we're not blessed with compelling comparative studies. I mean, given how much data is being fed to construct the Bayesian prior, you know, the, the model that I refer to and the ability to add covariates, as well as some of the other factors like not having to wait till steady state and only needing one level, it seems like the Bayesian method might be a better choice for calculating AUC in at least some clinical situations. That's a key point, the in some clinical situations. And that what we really need and are waiting for are compelling data to identify and characterize those situations. For now, I think it's fair to leave this as a pros versus cons situation. For some, for some institutions, the investment in money and training to convert to a Bayesian method probably makes sense. But for some other institutions, the simpler and less expensive trapezoidal method might be more than adequate. Both methods are a definite improvement over trough-only monitoring. Now, I don't want to say too much about continuous infusion 
uh, vancomycin, it's, it's a little bit of a separate subject, but I do want to point out that if you are giving vancomycin by continuous infusion, it's easy to calculate the area of the curve because it's simply the product of 24, 24 times whatever the steady state concentration is. I mean, that the, in theory, the concentration should be a straight line. You just get whatever that number that is, multiply by 24, that's your AUC. And on there's some pros and cons of whether or not continuous infusion vancomycin is a good or a bad thing. And that's a little bit apart from our discussion, but it is an easy way, it, it is an easy method in terms of calculating the area of the curve. So now that we've said all this, well, let's, let's do an area under the curve 24 calculation. And I've, here's a patient, here's some patient parameters. We'll call this a, a patient with osteomyelitis uh, due to MRSA, 42 year old male, five foot 10, 85 kilograms, serum creatinine 1.5. We could calculate these numbers from those data and figure out that the creatinine clearance of this patient is about 70. The guidelines tell us that for a patient like this, the initial dose should be somewhere between 20 and 35 milligrams per kilogram. And then the maintenance dose should be 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram every 12 hours. So I'm going to give an initial dose of 23 milligrams per kilogram because I don't feel the need to be particularly heroic with osteomyelitis. So we'll give a initial dose of 2000 and then we'll go, to, we'll go with 1500 milligrams every 12 hours, which is about 17.5 milligrams per kilogram every 12 hours. Now, what's the half-life of vancomycin in a patient like this? Well, at a patient with that creatinine clearance is probably around eight to 12 hours. So we'd like to wait to get to steady state. Steady state would be in 60 hours, 48 to 60, 60 hours. So we'll wait until maybe the fifth maintenance dose and then get our peak and trough and do our AUC 24 calculation. So it's been a few days now, we have that peak and trough. And here it is. We measure a 30.2 and we measure a 10.1. Those are steady state numbers. And we would like to know what the AUC 24 is. By the way, my chosen calculation of that I'm going to do this with has already calculated the true trough and the true peak. And I've just drawn them in there, but we don't know those numbers now. We simply know what was measured 30.2 and 10.1. I don't have access to Bayesian software. So I'm going to use an, a, a trapezoidal method to do this. And I'm going to choose, I guess not surprisingly, the Sanford guide calculator to do this. So if you look at the Sanford guide AUC 24 calculator, you are asked for seven pieces of data and here they are. And I've added, I've entered everything that I just told you in there. There's the peak, there's the trough. What confuses people sometimes are the time from starving infusion to measurement of peak. And I could just go back here. We need the number from the time the infusion started to the peak. So in that case, this is 2.5 hours. And then we also need the, the time, we need to know this distance. And I can get that distance if I know this distance. So it's important to have those numbers to capture all the area in the curve. So if we plug in these numbers as I've done and hit the button, we get an answer of 460, which we feel good about because our target is 400, 600. And if you had, there's some buttons down here. And if I, I just touched the show calculations button and you can actually see the way the calculations are done. I like, to, I like this from a teaching point of view so my students can clearly see what's going on. The calculator calculates the elimination rate constant the true peak, the true TOF. It calculates the area under the curve of the first trapezoid, the second trapezoid, then adds them together. And then if there's more than one uh, dose in a 24 hour period, it does the necessary math to provide the AUC 24. Now, what if conversely, we had gotten these numbers, 24.8 and 6.1. If we had fit, fit those numbers into the calculator, we would have had, we would have resulted in an area on the curve outside of the range, 343. And as you can see, the calculator warns you of that. It then reminds you how much Vanco you're giving and how much you need to give in order to get to the 400 to 600 range. 
And then it allows you to actually plug those numbers in and see what the AOC turns out to be. So I, I might look at this and say, well, I'm giving 3000 milligrams a day and I'm low at 1500 milligrams every 12 hours. I'll go to 1500 milligrams every eight hours and see what happens. So I've plugged, there's, I've plugged that in, here's the dose, here's the interval. And the calculator gives me my AUC that I would be expected, which makes me feel a whole lot better. Now I'm at 515. And it also gives me what the peak and trough should be, which, you know, as we make the transition from trough only to AUC monitoring is not a bad thing to have a sense of that. So that's how this calculator works. And Yeah, I'll just, I'll just stop with that. So now we, I want to share with you the two most popular words in medicine. And I will leave you with these summary points then uh, see if anybody has any questions. And these would be my summary points for the webinar today. For a serious MRSA infection, an AUC of 400, 600 should be targeted. And you can, for the time being, assume the MIC to be one. Doing this maximizes the efficacy, at least for MRSA, and minimizes the risk of acute kidney injury compared to trough-only monitoring. Point two, for other pathogens or other infections, the routine use of AUC as a monitoring tool is not well established and requires further study. There are pros and cons to the two methods of determining AUC, trapezoidal versus Bayesian, and I would just encourage you uh, to evaluate that on your own and, and make the decision, if, if you're in, in that decision-making role, that, that's right for you and right for your institution. We have demonstrated the way it's done using trapezoidal equations. And then finally, if you're administering vancomycin by continuous infusion, uh, this, it's simple to calculate the area of the curve. You simply measure a random steady state concentration and multiply that number by 24 and that will give you the area under the curve. So that's all I have to say today. And I think we have a minute or so left. So I'm going to escape out of this and go back to the main screen and see if there are any questions that Scott may have accumulated for me. So thank you so much for listening. Great, thank you so much, Professor Black. Um, we have a number of questions, so I'm just gonna start in no particular order. And uh, I don't think we'll have time to get to all of these, but we'll get started. Um, so one, uh, one attendee asks, if our vancomycin duration is for 48 hours, unless we have an ID consult or positive result, do you still recommend doing the AUC 24? If I understand that question quickly, so the, the duration of therapy is, is only 48 hours? Correct, unless they have an ID consult or positive result. No, I think I really, I, if I understand the question correctly, is I, I, I really feel that AUC, that trough-only monitoring is not, I mean, we've been doing that for a lot of years with, with pretty good success. And I, I view this for patients who are likely to be receiving therapy for five days or longer. So if we, if, if it really doesn't seem like it's going to be, and I think that's true a lot of times with vancomycin, the duration therapy isn't. People get started on vancomycin, and the drug gets stopped fairly soon. Uh, I would say I would say not necessarily if it's going to be a short duration like that. All right. Uh, next question: Can AUC or MIC dosing uh, be applied to obese, pediatric, or underweight patients? Uh, great question, and I think the answer is we think so, but it all depends on how much data you require, and. I have no reason to think it, it can't, and I don't have any, any data to suggest it can't, I, but I, I think if you're someone who requires good data to, to prove that, that you're gonna have to wait a little bit longer because some of these special populations, we, we don't have the, the necessarily the data we, we need. Our belief it does, is that it does, but the data would be nice. All right. Um, another question we have here is uh, letters and commentaries very critical of the guidelines were published in Clinical Infectious Diseases in September. Uh, have you had a chance to read these yet? And if so, what are your thoughts on those? I actually, I know exactly what you're talking about because I actually did read those. I read the, and 
I'm trying to remember what the points were. I mean, some of these points were some of the points we had made here, which is, I mean, I, I think someone made the point that are we really ready for universal guidelines? And no, I mean, these are not universal guidelines. And I, I believe that that was, was shared by the authors of the guidelines is of the original guidelines. So, you know, these should not be viewed as guidelines for any, anybody, anytime you use vancomycin. But for serious MRSA infections, different story. But that was one criticism. Another criticism was about the variability of the MIC. And you know, we've talked a little bit about, about that, but I mean, that's a known issue is depending on how you measure the MIC, you're gonna get different numbers. Another issue was the duration of therapy. And that if vancomycin is only gonna be given for a couple of days anyway, should we be doing all of this? And I think we've talked about that. And I don't, I don't think so. I don't believe that the guideline authors felt so either. And another point, which I now now doesn't now escapes me was made by that in that rebuttal or that to them. Oh, I think the one of the authors and one of the rebuttals had made the comment that the incidence of MRSA is on the decline. I'll just I uh, well I'm I'm not sure what to say about that because I didn't I actually track down that the data for which he he made that statement that that may be true it it may be true in certain places. Overall, my conclusion from the comments in the clinical infectious disease article were they were reasonable, but they, to me, they didn't invalidate the guidelines. They just kind of added to them and, and highlighted some key distinctions. Great. Um, so this is a, a good question here. Hypothetically, is AUC of 450 less efficacious than an AUC of 575? Again, another, yeah, another million dollar question, really. And I, I think I'm pretty, pretty, feel pretty common saying, who knows? I mean, it seems like, no, I'm not even gonna say that. I, I don't think you can make that statement. I, that, that, that 500 is better than 400 or what do we know for sure? We know that we know for sure that if we get above 600, we start seeing toxicity problems. We know that. We also have in vitro data that below 400, we may see more resistance. So, I mean, I think we can book, part, book and the ratio pretty well, the, the range pretty well. But to make further conclusions about the value of numbers within the range, I think it's really, would be really stretching the available data. And I would be as happy with 450 as I would be 515 or for the numbers that you asked. I would be as, personally as a clinician, I would be as happy with either one of those numbers. Great. And I, I think we have time for, I'm going to do one more here, uh, Professor Black, and then we will, uh, we've seen quite a few other questions. Uh, we will collect those and see if we can get you some answers. We'll put those on sanfordguide.com forward slash vancomycin. Uh, so we will post those hopefully sometime uh, in the next couple of weeks. So if your question was not answered during the webinar, uh, do feel free to, uh, uh, to keep an eye on that, on that web page moving forward. We also might put some in our ID update newsletter, which if you're interested in subscribing is free. And the link is in the chat window for this webinar. Um, so one last question. The guidelines cite a simulation study as evidence that correlation between AUC and trough is poor, yet many clinical data are available that show good correlation. Why give more weight to simulation data, especially when they simulate vancomycin one gram uh, every eight hours in renally impaired as low as 20 milliliters? And I'm assuming that's per milligram or something like that, but go ahead. Well, you know the old saying that if you if you torture the numbers enough, you can get them to say anything. And <laughs> I think this is this is often the problem with with matters like this is that you you almost never have studies that all point in the same direction. And we do our best to interpret them in the aggregate. And I, I'm certain that there are published papers that suggest contrary. You know, views to all this, but I really, I firmly believe that if you look at everything in in the aggregate, that the even, simply going back to that graphic I showed, that it's completely reasonable that a a single number, a trough, might not predict an area on a curve in everybody. I mean, it might predict it in some people. Well, I guess is the other point we we can make about all which which is so much true in medicine is 
uh, lots of things may be true and the challenge is finding out in who they are that are true and we, we have a hard time identifying who they are. I, I think mathematically it's very plausible that the, that the trough will not predict the area of the curve in everybody. So I have no trouble believing that. And I have no trouble believing the studies that show that. I also have no trouble acknowledging that there may be certain patients in which the predictive value is good. But since I can't identify who them, they are, I'm gonna lean more toward the AUC. But again, let's point out that's in, that's in a particular type of patient. That's not every patient. And that's not, I'm not talking about streptococci or enterococci or coagulase negative staph. I'm talking here about specifically MRSA in people getting multiple weeks of therapy. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Black, for your time this afternoon. Uh, I, I realize everyone's very busy right now, so we are going to uh, cut this webinar off so that folks can get back to other things. Uh, but thank you all for attending. Uh, if you do have more questions for our editorial team, uh, uh, Professor Black or others, um, you can always email those to us, info at sanfordguide.com, or submit those on our website. Uh, they do get passed along to our editorial board. Uh, again, uh, Dr. Black is our editor of the monthly ID update newsletter, uh, which is a free newsletter we send out. You don't have to be a Sanford Guide subscriber to receive that. Um, and uh, the link for that is in the chat window and also at our website. And finally, uh, thank you again, uh, Professor Black, for sharing your expertise with us this afternoon. Scott, thank you so much for having me. And to everyone who attended and took time out from their busy schedule, I, I really appreciate it. I, I, I put some time into preparing and I wanted to, to you know, share what I know. And I, I just really appreciate you, you coming and, and, and giving good questions. And it's a, it's a topic in flux and we're gonna know more next year than we do now. But I think this is pretty close to where we stand right now. And I, I do appreciate the attention. Everybody stay well.